Chapter Six of Abraham Lincoln and the Abolition of Slavery in the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Schmidt. Abraham Lincoln and the Abolition of Slavery in the United States by Charles Godfrey Leland. Chapter Six a suspected conspiracy, Lincoln's departure for Washington, his speeches at Springfield and on the road to the national capital, breaking out of the rebellion, treachery of President Buchanan, treason in the cabinet, Jefferson Davis's message, threats of massacre and ruin to the northern-southern sympathizers, Lincoln's inaugural address, the cabinet, the days of doubt and of darkness. It was unfortunate for Lincoln that he listened to the predictions of his alarmed friends. So generally did the idea prevail that an effort would be made to kill him on his way to Washington that a few fellows of the lower class in Baltimore, headed by a barber named Ferrandina, thinking to gain a little notoriety, as they actually did get some money from Southern sympathizers, gave out that they intended to murder Mr. Lincoln on his journey to Washington. Immediately, a number of detectives was set to work, and as everybody seemed to wish to find a plot, a plot was found, or imagined, and Lincoln was persuaded to pass privately and disguised on a special train from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, to Washington, where he arrived February 23, 1861. Before leaving Springfield, he addressed his friends at the moment of parting at the railway station in a speech of impressive simplicity. Friends, no one who has never been placed in a like position can understand my feelings at this hour, nor the oppressive sadness I feel at this parting. For more than a quarter of a century I have lived among you, and during all that time I have received nothing but kindness at your hands. Here I have lived, from youth until now I am an old man. Here the most sacred ties of the earth were assumed. Here all my children were born, and here one of them lies buried. To you, dear friends, I owe all that I have, all that I am. All the strange, checkered past seems now to crowd upon my mind. Today I leave you. I go to assume a task more difficult than that which devolved upon Washington. Unless the great God who assisted him shall be with me and aid me, I must fail. But if the same omniscient mind and almighty arm that directed and protected him shall guide and support me, I shall not fail. I shall succeed. Let us all pray that the God of our fathers may not forsake us now. To him I commend you all. Permit me to ask that with equal sincerity and faith you will invoke his wisdom and guidance for me. With these few words I must leave you, for how long I know not. Friends, one and all, I must now bid you an affectionate farewell. It may be observed that in this speech Lincoln, notwithstanding his conciliatory offers to the South, apprehended a terrible war, and that when speaking from the heart, he showed himself a religious man. If he ever spoke in earnest, it was on this occasion. One who had heard him a hundred times declared that he never saw him so profoundly affected, nor did he ever utter an address which seemed so full of simple and touching eloquence as this. It left his audience deeply affected, but the same people were more deeply moved at his return. At eight o'clock, says Lehman, the train rolled out of Springfield among the cheers of the populace. Four years later, a funeral train, covered with the emblems of splendid mourning, rolled into the same city, bearing a corpse whose obsequies were being celebrated in every part of the civilized world. Lincoln made several speeches at different places along his route from Springfield to Philadelphia and in all he freely discussed the difficulties of the political crisis, expressing himself to the effect that there was really no danger or no crisis, since he was resolved 
with all the union-loving men of the north to grant the south all its rights but these addresses were not all sugar and rosewater at philadelphia he said now in my view of the present aspect of affairs there need be no bloodshed or war there is no necessity for it i am not in favor of such a course and i may say in advance that there will be no bloodshed unless it be forced upon the government and that it will be compelled to act in self-defense lincoln had declared that the duties which would devolve upon him would be greater than those which had devolved upon any american since washington during this journey the wisdom firmness and ready tact of his speeches already indicated that he would perform these duties of statesmanship in a masterly manner he was received courteously by immense multitudes but at this time so very little was known of him beyond the fact that he was called honest old abe the rail splitter and that he had sprung from that most illiterate source a poor southern backwoods family that even his political friends went to hear him with misgivings or with shame there was a general impression that the republican party had gained a victory by truckling to the mob and by elevating one of its roughest types to leadership and the gaunt uncouth appearance of the president-elect fully confirmed this opinion but when he spoke it was as if a spell had been removed the disguise of odin fell away and people knew the great man called to struggle with and conquer the rebellious giants a hero coming with the right strength at the right time it was at this time that the conspiracy which had been preparing in earnest for thirty years and which the north for as many years refused to suspect had burst forth south carolina had declared that if lincoln was elected she would secede and on the seventeenth december eighteen sixty she did so true to her word if not to her duty in quick succession six states followed her there being little or no struggle in those which lay upon the gulf against the wild tornado of excitement in favor of rebellion in the border states says arnold in maryland virginia north carolina tennessee and missouri there was however a terrible contest the union ultimately triumphed in maryland kentucky and missouri while the rebels carried tennessee with great difficulty virginia seceded on april seventeenth eighteen sixty one and north carolina on the twentieth of may everything had for years been made ready for them president buchanan who preceded lincoln a man of feeble mind and entirely devoted to the south had either suffered the rebels to do all in their power to facilitate secession or had directly aided them the secretary of war john b floyd who became a noted rebel had for months been at work to paralyze the northern army he ordered a hundred fifteen thousand muskets to be made in northern arsenals at the expense of the federal government and sent them all to the south with vast numbers of cannon mortars ammunition and munitions of war the army reduced to sixteen thousand men was sent to remote parts of the country and as the great majority of its officers were southern men they of course resigned their commissions and went over to the southern confederacy howell cobb of georgia afterwards a rebel general was secretary of the treasury and as his contribution to the southern cause did his utmost and with great success to cause ruin in his department to injure the national credit and empty the treasury in fact the whole cabinet with the supple president for a willing tool were busy for months in doing all in their power to utterly break up the government to support which they had pledged their faith in god and their honor as gentlemen linked with them in disgrace were all those who after uniting in holding an election for president refused to abide by its results on the twentieth november eighteen sixty the attorney general of the united states jur s black gave as his aid to treason the official opinion that congress has no right to carry on war against any state 
either to prevent a threatened violation of the constitution or to enforce an acknowledgment that the government of the united states was supreme and to use those words of raymond it soon became evident that the president adopted this theory as the basis and guide of his executive action on the night of january fifth eighteen sixty one the leading conspirators jefferson davis with senators toombs iverson slidell benjamin wigfall and others held a meeting at which it was resolved that the south should secede but that all the seceding senators and representatives should retain their seats as long as possible in order to inflict injury to the last on the government which they had officially pledged themselves to protect at the suggestion probably of mr benjamin all who retired were careful to draw not only their pay but also to spoil the egyptians by taking all the stationery documents and mileage or allowance for travelling expenses on which they could lay their hands only two of all the slave state representatives remained true mr bolligny from new orleans and andrew j hamilton from texas when president lincoln came to washington it was indeed to enter a house divided against itself tottering to its fall its inner chambers a mass of ruin the seven states which had seceded sent delegates which met at montgomery alabama february fourth eighteen sixty one and organized a government and constitution similar to that of the united states under which jefferson davis was president and alexander h stevens vice president no one had threatened the new southern government and at this stage the north would have suffered it to withdraw in peace from the union so great was the dread of a civil war but the south did not want peace every southern newspaper every rebel orator was now furiously demanding of the north the most humiliating concessions and threatening bloodshed as the alternative while president lincoln in his inaugural address spoke with the most christian forbearance of the south jefferson davis in his assumed all the horrors of civil war as a foregone conclusion he said that if they were permitted to secede quietly all would be well if forced to fight they could and would maintain their position by the sword and would avail themselves to the utmost of the liberties of war he expected that the north would be the theatre of war but no northern city ever felt the rebel sword while there was not one in the south which did not suffer terribly from the effects of war never in history was the awful curse ve victis so freely invoked by those who were destined to be conquered it was characteristic of lincoln to illustrate his views on all subjects by anecdotes which were so aptly put as to present in a few words the full force of his argument immediately after his election when the world was vexed with the rumors of war he was asked what he intended to do when he got to washington that he replied puts me in mind of a little story there was once a clergyman who expected during the course of his next day's riding to cross the fox river at a time when the stream would be swollen by a spring freshet making the passage extremely dangerous on being asked by anxious friends if he was not afraid and what he intended to do the clergyman calmly replied i have travelled this country a great deal and i can assure you that i have no intention of trying to cross fox river until i get to it the dangers of the political river which mr lincoln was to cross were very great it is usual in england to regard the struggle of the north with the south during the rebellion as that of a great power with a lesser one and sympathy was in consequence given to the so-called weaker side but the strictest truth shows that the union party what with the copperheads or sympathizers with the south at home and with open foes in the field was never at any time much more than equal to either branch of the enemy and that far from being the strongest in numbers it was as one to two those in its ranks who secretly aided the enemy were numerous and powerful the union armies were sometimes led by generals whose hearts were with the foe 
and for months after the war broke out the entire telegraph service of the union was owing to the treachery of officials entirely at the service of the confederates it must be fairly admitted and distinctly borne in mind that the south had at least good apparent reason for believing that the north would yield to any demands and was so corrupt that it would crumble at a touch into numberless petty warring states while the confederacy firm and united would eventually master them all and rule the continent for years leaders like president buchanan had been their most submissive tools and the number of men in the north who were willing to grant them everything very nearly equaled that of the republican party from the beginning they were assured by the press and leaders of the democrats or copperheads that they would soon conquer and receive material aid from northern sympathizers and there were in all the northern cities many of these who were eagerly awaiting a break-up of the union in order that they might profit by its ruin thus immediately after the secession of south carolina fernando wood mayor of new york issued a proclamation in which he recommended that it should secede and become a free city all over the country democrats like wood were looking forward to revolutions in which something might be picked up and not a few really spoke of the revival of titles of nobility all of these prospective governors of lordly baratarius avowed sympathy with the south it was chiefly by reliance on these northern sympathizers that the confederacy was led to its ruin president lincoln found himself in command of a beleaguered fortress which had been systematically stripped and injured by his predecessor a powerful foe storming without and nearly half his men doing their utmost to aid the enemy from within on the fourth march eighteen sixty one lincoln took the oath to fulfill his duties as president and delivered his inaugural address in this he began by asserting that he had no intention of interfering with slavery as it existed or of interfering in any way with the rights of the south and urged that by law fugitive slaves must be restored to their owners in reference to the efforts being made to break up the union he maintained that by universal law and by the constitution the union of the states must be perpetual it is safe to assert he declared that no government proper ever had a provision in its organic law for its own termination with great wisdom and in the most temperate language he pointed out the impossibility of any government in the true sense of the word being liable to dissolution because a party wished it one party to a contract may violate or break it but it requires all to lawfully rescind it i therefore consider that in view of the constitution and the laws the union is unbroken and to the extent of my ability i shall take care as the constitution itself expressly enjoins upon me that the laws of the union be faithfully executed in all the states doing this i deem to be only a simple duty on my part and i shall perform it as far as practicable unless my rightful masters the american people shall withhold the requisite means or in some authoritative manner direct the contrary he asserted that the power confided to him would be used to hold and possess all government property and collect duties but went so far in conciliation as to declare that wherever hostility to the united states should be so great and universal as to prevent competent resident citizens from holding the federal offices there would be no attempt to force obnoxious strangers among the people for that object where the enforcement of such matters though legally right might be irritating and nearly impracticable he would deem it better to forego for a time the uses of such offices he pointed out that the principle of secession was simply that of anarchy that to admit the claim of a minority would be to destroy any government while he indicated with great intelligence the precise limits of the functions of the supreme court and he briefly explained the impossibility of a divided union existing save in a jarring and ruinous manner physically speaking he said we cannot separate 
we cannot remove our respective sections from each other nor build an impassable wall between them a husband and wife may be divorced and go out of the presence and beyond the reach of each other but the different parts of our country cannot do this they cannot but remain face to face and intercourse either amicable or hostile must continue between them why should there not be he added a patient confidence in the ultimate justice of the people is there any better or equal hope in the world in our present differences is either party without faith of being in the right if the mighty ruler of nations with his eternal truth and justice be on your side of the north or on yours of the south that truth and that justice will surely prevail by the judgment of this great tribunal of the american people it has been well said that this address was the wisest utterance of the time yet it was with all its gentle and conciliatory feelings at once misrepresented through the south as a malignant and tyrannical threat of war for to such a pitch of irritability and arrogance had the entire southern party been raised that any words from a northern ruler not expressive of the utmost devotion to their interests seemed literally like an insult it was not enough to promise them to be bound by law when they held that the only law should be their own will to those who lived through the dark and dreadful days which preceded the outburst of the war every memory is like that of one who has passed through the valley of the shadow of death it was known that the enemy was coming from abroad yet there were few who could really regard him as an enemy for it was as when a brother advances to slay a brother and the victim not believing in the threat rises to throw himself into the murderer's arms and vigorous defense was further paralyzed by the feeling that traitors were everywhere at work in the army in the cabinet in the family circle president lincoln proceeded at once to form his cabinet it consisted of william h seward who had been his most formidable competitor at the chicago convention who became secretary of state simon cameron whose appointment proved as discreditable to mr lincoln as to the country as secretary of war salmon p chase secretary of the treasury gideon wells secretary of the navy caleb b smith secretary of the interior montgomery blair postmaster general and edward bates attorney general it was well for the president that these were all except cameron wise and honest men for the situation of the country was one of doubt danger and disorganization in congress in every drawing-room there were people who boldly asserted and believed in the words of a rebel expressed to b f butler that the north could not fight that the south had too many allies there you have friends said mr butler in the north who will stand by you as long as you fight your battles in the union but the moment you fire on the flag the northern people will be a unit against you and you may be assured if war comes slavery ends orators and editors in the north proclaimed in the boldest manner that the union must go to fragments and ruin and that the only hope of safety lay in suffering the south to take the lead and in humbly following her the number of these despairing people or croakers as they were called was very great they believed that republicanism had proved itself a failure and that on slavery alone could a firm government be based open treason was unpunished it was boldly said that southern armies would soon be on northern soil the new administration seemed to be without a basis in those days no men except rebels seemed to know what to do. End of chapter 6